Fuck my life. I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> God damn. Thank you, Dragon. Let me start this all over again. Hey, that was a waste of time. <laughs> God damn it. Thank you. Okay, let's try this again. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Team here. And apparently I just screwed up like five minutes of audio. Well, there we go. Um, so <laughs> thank you for saying, Dragon. Uh, I hope you can hear it now. So that should be working. Well, man, that... That just shows you know how tired I am after all those travels and this is uh, once again why I've been delaying this whole thing because yesterday I was half dead and still have to do some things here at home. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's why we're basically doing this on uh, Saturday but this is building um, BXJS Weekly uh, episode 8 already. We've been doing this for quite some time and you know it's, it's quite fun actually if I would uh, say so myself. So this week around, we don't really have that many news, but there are some really awesome releases and some pretty neat libraries that I want to talk about. So I'm, I'm thinking that's not going to take too much time, but hey, you know, let's get started um, again because I screwed up the audio, God damn it. Okay, our first article is called Defeating Electron. And uh, contrary to the name, it actually talks about the advantages of electron and why is it so popular and what needs to happen f to make electron disappear and uh, a lot of those points are really good and really solid and they are very well argued and if i were to sum this article up um, in one sentence that will be this top highlight that it actually has um, if you wanted to defeat electron you will need to fill it too you will need to do a better job than electron is doing today which is absolutely truth. And I don't think there's any other framework or uh, set of tools that allow you to do things that Electron does. Um, if I would to look at this whole Electron situation idealistically, um, then I would say that the, at least in my opinion, the ideal solution to it would be to replace Electron with a browsers because I mean, it is kind of a browser, but with more, way more access to the hardware, right? You have the Node.js there, you have some separate threads that you can use for heavy computations, maybe native modules, but I don't think they are heavily used. Um, so it would be really cool to see the browsers replace the Electron. And this is kind of what we're moving to, right? Because the browser are now getting all the Bluetooth API, file API and all that kind of stuff. So Maybe that's what, yeah, exactly. Progressive web apps are kind of going that way, but um, since web standards are pretty, you know, slow area and takes a lot of time to properly develop it, we're gonna, Electron is gonna hang around for some time. So yeah, um, definitely again, if you're interested in Electron, if you hate Electron, read this article, it's really solid. Right, moving next, we got the evolution of the New York Times tech stack. Uh, this is a very lengthy article that talks about the New York Times tech stack and how they came to a specific technology. This is essentially done in uh, categories for each tech, for each uh, area as a dialogue and you know how exactly they came to it, what kind of problems they solved with it. And there's a lot of text in it. A very, very interesting read, very cool things here. If you did not know, uh, New York Times does a lot of data science-y um, kind of work and a lot of data visualization, work with data, data journalism and all that stuff. So they have a very interesting tech stack. So if you are interested in this kind of things, then this is a very good and very interesting read through with uh, very in-depth insights into all of the technologies that they use, including BigQuery, GraphQL and all that kind of thing. So it's kind of um, pretty amazing that they really, they are willing to share all of their stories. So this is definitely a very insightful piece. Okay, moving next, we got a uh, learning higher components in React by building a loading screen. Uh, if for some reason you are working with React and still don't understand high order components or want to learn them, maybe you or know you're just starting, it's a pretty great article that explains why uh, higher order components can be very useful and why uh, and how exactly you use them on an example of a simple loading screen, right? So you use a loading screen as a wrapper component, which is something you put above your own components. Uh, where is the example codes? Come on, show me. Um, blah, 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 come on, okay, whatever. So basically the article talks about creating higher order component on example of a loading screen that will wrap your own component and show the loading to the user, right? So pretty straightforward, very well written, very easy to understand. If you still don't know how higher order components work or why would you need them, do have a read through that. You will quite likely learn everything you need to know about them. Right, continuing, we got, um, pretty um, high order component versus render props. 
I'm not going to talk about that. I mean, both are viable approaches. I think it just comes down to the use case. You know, uh, sometimes the one works better than the other. So it's like, uh, you just have to decide for yourself. I don't think it, one is inherently better, be, uh, worse than the other one. So this is my point, essentially. It's like, it's just a different tools. Like you cannot really do some things with render props that you can do with, uh, or no, the other way around. You cannot really do some things that you can do with uh, render. No, wait. Oh man, I'm too tired for this. Basically, <laughs> just look at your use case, decide what works better and take it. And there's no problems with sticking to one of them. It's like, if it works for you, it's fine. So yeah. All right, let us continue. Um, the next article we got here is writing web assembly by hand. It is a pretty large one as well, pretty crazy one um, in terms of, you know, I don't really know that many people who want to write assembly by hand, although there are definitely people like that and there are use cases for that. I used to write assembly myself uh, way, way, way back in time when I used to program microcontrollers, but I would not say it was fun. <laughs> it was an interesting experience for sure. But essentially, if you never worked with assembly, uh, like x86 or whatever, and you never written any of it, this is a very good intro into how the web assembly works, how it compares to the um, normal assembly. There is a part, um, no, it's not here actually, it's another article, okay. So how exactly it works, uh, how do you write it by hand, how do you work with memory, how do you work with boundaries and all that kind of stuff. So if you are looking to get into WebAssembly, if you for whatever reason uh, need to not just transpile the code from C, Rust or you know TypeScript, whatever, to WebAssembly, but also to optimize it maybe, then this is a really good intro to how the syntax looks, how do you write it, how do you do simple things. So there's like the how to implement game state uh, and you know how do you direct uh, and directly access the memory and stuff like this which is a really, really cool. And then in the end, you build the game of life essentially in WebAssembly, which is kind of insane, but hey, it works. So yeah, pretty good article, uh, do have a look at it. Um, speaking of WebAssembly, uh, so it has this, because it's not just the, um, it's not your typical assembly, right? Because it runs within the browser and it is a stack-based virtual machine essentially, right? And it needs to be not just fast, right? Because it's assembly, but it also needs to be safe because we are still within the browser. So it has some unique things like dynamic dispatch. So this article goes pretty in depth on a dynamic dispatch called indirect and uh, like object traits. And here we go. Here's the comparison of uh, x64 web assembly and uh, disassembly of web assembly into normal assembly to actually see what the hell happens under the hood. So once again, if you're interested in assembly and web assembly, do have a look at this article, it goes pretty in depth and very interesting to read. So yeah, do have a look at that. All right, continuing. We got an article from uh, Google guys from Web for the Metals section, is called replace animated GIFs with video. And um, it's a very strong case. So if you're still using GIFs, please don't because they are enormously large and they take a lot of space. And this article basically shows you how to take a GIF and you know this, in this case, they have like a 40 meg GIF. They take it and convert it to an 867K MP4 file, which is like, yeah, that's a 93% reduction. So, and then additionally with some additional tweaks and features, um, it's like, yeah, um, have I tried Blazor? No, I have not tried Blazor with C Sharp. I have actually yet to delve into WebAssembly in general myself because I have not had any fitting use case for it. Basically all my projects are very straightforward so far and I don't really need that performance. Okay, um, yeah, so there's like converting GIF to MP4. There's a case for converting GIF to WebM, which is even smaller than MP4 actually, which is kind of crazy, but I mean, WebM is a pretty good format. And then uh, the examples of HTML, how exactly you replace the image tag with a video tag to make it look like GIF, right? So it's, you just have to add some like disable controls, play in line, auto loop, muted and so on and so forth. So there you go. Very straightforward, but it's still a very good guideline on how to work with that stuff. So if you're working with GIFs, please consider swapping them for video and or maybe GIF V, which is also a better format. All right. 
The next thing we have here is the future of native modules in Node.js. So this week we got Node.js 10 released, which I will be talking about slightly later in the releases section. And it came along with a new NRP, which we'll be talking about in just a bit. So before, when you written the native modules for Node, you had to use NAN. Uh, which is native abstractions for Node.js, a package made by Rod Vag, uh, and it's an incredible package. It simplified writing native modules significantly because you never, you basically after using NAN, you uh, could stop worrying about the changing the eight APIs over the versions, which was like a huge pain in the ass essentially. And NAN abstracted all of this. It worked pretty well, but basically, you know, it had to be maintained, and it actually made sense to just put it inside of the node. And this is kind of exactly what they did. In Node 10 adds an API as a stable thing, so it's now completely there. Uh, it's I think yeah, it's Node API, uh, so an API short for it. It's basically you no longer need to recompile modules, which is kind of great. Uh, that was like one of the largest pain I think with the native modules. You can allow this is really awesome part. So basically, since those an API are fixed. You can actually allow other engines than V8, which I will also talk about a bit in the releases section. Um, there are yes six modules and nodes, uh, and I will talk about that in release section two. Let us finish with the native modules. And yes, the most awesome thing is once Electron integrates the latest nodes and latest V8, we're going to be use those modules across Electron as long as there is basically an RP compatible, which is freaking amazing. I just love this change. So um, seems like they are also backporting it to uh, latest like the LTS versions of eight and six, which is great. And we're going to see how that ends up. But you know, the whole NAPI thing is just incredible. And yeah, it talks a bit about the future, kind of what times, uh, what how's this gonna work. So it seems like an API is the thing that will be supported for a lot, long of time, unless they come up with something better. So yeah, it's definitely a win for a whole Node.js community. All right, uh, continuing, we got an article, Advanced Node.js Project Structure Tutorial. I would not call it tutorial. I would call it a very opinionated write-up on how do you structure your Node.js projects because as I already discussed it at some point, I think that is a very personal thing that you should figure out within your company or within your projects, right? But this is a pretty good write-up on how you can structure your projects, uh, web projects specifically with uh, workers, websites, client-side models, database, configs, and so on and so forth. Some interesting thoughts here, some pretty solid logic reasoning. Uh, but again, this is highly opinionated, obviously, and not exactly the only right way, you know, so don't take it seriously. But still, you know, if you're still struggling with it, do have a read through, do have a look at the project structure, and see how that works for you. Maybe you pick up a few interesting uh, ideas here. All right, continue. Got a pretty short one, actually. It's um, just a tip. If you did, I like I was actually surprised to learn on Twitter that some people did not know that. Um, you can actually npm install directories. Uh, so say if you have a very some other project library or whatever, you can actually npm install a parent folder, right? So in this case, he npm installs helpers into tool one. And this will just a sim sim link thing and reinstall dependencies, right? Or like link it um, with the already installed ones. This is very helpful if you are doing that for local development, obviously, you can really publish that because that doesn't work because you have reference to a file. But for local development, this works amazingly well. So in case you did not know about that uh, little thingy, this is very helpful. Okay, continuing. Uh, this article is actually very awesome. Uh, it's called Shared Elements Transitions for the Web. And it's a pretty cool write up about the shared element transitions. So the shared element transitions are the ones that you see like here, for example, when the two screens have one element that always stays on both of them, right? And typically, like there are better examples here, like those mobile, uh, the, the, what do you call it, the material design, right? So Google is a very, um, um, how do you put it in English? Google is very uh, committed to it, right? So they, they, everything should be fluid, everything should flow, and those shared elements help this kind of flow, right? And Apple started doing this stuff as well. So you have this kind of very fluid, very nice looking interfaces with cool animations that look, um, yeah, fluid. <laughs> I'm repeating myself, but whatever. So this article goes in depth and talks about how do you exactly do that with uh, web. And specifically, I think they're using Preact here. 
um, or React, was it? I think it was a React or Preact. I believe it was Preact. Uh, but basically, yeah, so they provide the code, they give you examples. And yeah, it is Preact. Okay. And you can actually try and uh, implement it yourself or just use the library that is uh, shown here. And as you can see here, it does those yeah, shard element transitions that look pretty neat, actually. It's like it looks pretty well. And, uh, you know, um, again, Progressive web apps and web are getting to that spot where you might not even need anything else but the web browser, which is, in my opinion, just amazing. I'm absolutely loving it. All right, next thing is, I mean, I put it into a news category, but it's like closer to the releases, but I found it just really cool. So, you know, I'll just glance over it, basically. Qt added a beta for WebAssembly. Uh, so you can now do this WebAssembly technology preview and you can actually compile Qt to WebAssembly, which is kind of insane, in my opinion. I mean, in the end, it's just C under the hood, you know, but still, like compiling the Qt itself into WebAssembly is pretty insane. Um, so yeah, if you are using Qt or if you are interested in something like this, do have a look, pretty neat, uh, pretty cool. I'm quite excited to see where it develops and what, you know, what kind of comes out of it. So yes. All right, continuing. We got another article from Mozilla Hacks, guys. Uh, it's called Testing Strategies for React and Redux. And, uh, you know, I'm not gonna go too much into details here, but essentially, if you still have any problems with uh, figuring out how to test React and Redux combination, do have a look at this one and it's a very, as usual, you know, from Mozilla Hacks, it's a very in-depth right through very, uh, lots of use cases covered, a lot of information about each step, how you do that with the summary and everything. Additional, you know, points to the Redux add-ons ecosystem and all that stuff. So again, uh, Q, I think Qt was used for BlackBerry US 10. Yeah, I think BlackBerry US did some crazy stuff with their latest iteration. They they used a lot of things that didn't work out for them, sadly. But um, yeah, I mean, Qt is a pretty great thing. Like if you know how to use it, it's definitely one of the best UI frameworks out there. Although, you know, C, C++ is hard to write in comparison to a higher level languages, obviously. All right, continuing, we got a beginner's guide to Webpack 4 and module bundling. Um, Again, this is more of an introduction. So if you are still struggling with Webpack, if you still don't understand Webpack, or maybe you wanna learn it more in depth, then this is a, again, very large write up on just about everything you need to know about Webpack, starting from using the Webpack itself and ending to, you know, using the uh, loaders, configuring your Babel, SAS, CSS and JS, image loaders, whatever you can imagine, it's all here. Code splitting is also covered. Plugins are also covered. So basically, if you need a refresher on Webpack or if you want to learn it from scratch, this is a pretty good article covering hot reloading and all that stuff and HTTP2 even, which is neat. This is something I don't know, by the way, so I should probably read it a bit more carefully. <laughs> all right, uh, next article we have is um article that urges you to drop Webpack and give Parcel a try. You might like it. So it's actually very interesting because the article is written in a way that first it introduces you to a project set up with a Webpack, right? So here's you set up TypeScript, React, you add Webpack, you configure Webpack config, you write all those things, you know, extract CSS, whatever, you do this thing, you see the result, it works, cool. And then you take Parcel, you install Parcel, you just do Parcel index TSX and it works. <laughs> and they're like, maybe you don't need Webpack. And there's a GIF that pretty much sums the whole idea of Parcel. I used Parcel in a couple of projects. It's an amazing tool. It's definitely, at least at the time when I used it, which was like half a year ago, I think, it wasn't as flexible as Webpack, but it already was quite amazing for a medium-sized project. Maybe by now it actually already is as flexible as a Webpack, so I probably should revisit it at some point. But man, you know, the fact that you can replace all of that with just one Parcel is freaking amazing. Like, you know, again, if you are looking at a medium-sized project and... Um, don't want to set up Webpack, definitely give a parcel a try. It looks pretty solid. Um, all right, continuing. We got GUACT, React in 160 lines of JavaScript. So it's, as you guess, it's essentially an article that talks about how to build your own React, how React works, what is VDOM, how does VDOM works, how do you sort of diff it, how do you render it, and so on and so forth. So if you are using React but want to understand the underlying stuff, you want to understand how React works, you want to know how the VDOM works, how it functions, you can read through this, you can re-implement your own React and uh, you will basically know the core of it, right? So 
to be frank, uh, and they talk about this at the very end, this is not exactly a copy of React, right? Because React is way more complex. It supports things like fragments, portal, context, references, and other crazier things in the new version. It uses React Fibers, which is like asynchronous rendering and all that crazy things, which is actually quite hard to implement and took them like almost a year of very talented engineers at Facebook to develop, right? So you can't really do it in 160 lines of code. But still, if you want to understand the core of React, this is a really solid article that does a very well, um, like a very good job at introducing it. Um, and again, they, you know, they frankly talk about the support for all those other things. So yeah. All right. Continuing, we got, uh, yes, this is a, again, Node 10 article, um, complete introduction to async functions and ES6 modules in Node.js. It is essentially articles that introduces you to using um, things that are available in Node 10. So MJS stuff, right? First of all, we can now use it without any flags or whatever. So you can just import stuff from MJS and it works which is great on one hand. On the other hand, I hate personally MJS extension. So I don't know, I mean, I'm, maybe I just get used to it. I haven't tried it yet. Um, yeah, it also talks about the async stuff in FS. So if you didn't know the node 10 comes with the FS module uh, permissified, so you can actually use this promises, which is great. Uh, but mostly it is an introduction into how to use the S6 modules, MJS files, and how do you, for example, write express app with it and stuff like this. So if you are still, for whatever reason, never used imports in the ESX modules. This is a pretty good uh, write up and uh, definitely is a solid introduction on how to use that. So do have a look. <clears throat> All right, continuing, we got the new NPM CLI a year in review or the, let me try that again. A new NPM CLI a year in review or what you have might have missed. Um, the idea is that a recap of what NPM has done over the last year. Um, Obviously, you know, if you have been tr keep tracking on the news or if you've been watching my podcast, you know that, you know, they've shipped quite a lot of versions actually and they did quite a lot of changes, right? So they are way faster now and I think Yarn pushed them a lot to be faster, to be honest. But there are some, yeah, really, really cool improvements like almost they are 16-fold between NPM4 at least and especially with the CI stuff. They've added package lock. Again, Yarn is probably the one to blame for to praise for it maybe because yarn lock has been um, our savior in Jesus essentially at this point, because package lock still has some wonky issues from time to time. I don't know, it's just, it just doesn't seem to nail it just as good as the um, uh, yarn guys do. I don't know why, but we'll see how it develops. And peaks is actually something I really genuinely like. So I, I stopped installing my stuff globally. I just run and peaks most of the time. Um, NPM CI is pretty nice addition. Have yet to try that because I generally use yarn almost everywhere, but it's nice that they have a thing that basically just, you know, runs stuff from package JSON, uh, package log JSON and doesn't touch anything else and which increases the install speed and everything. So it just reveals the structure from package log. Um, two factor authentication token management. Um, on one hand, it's a really cool feature. It's always great to have two factor authentication, something I always turn on. On the other hand, um, if you turn on the factor authentication, you cannot publish your packages from CI to NPM, which is annoying as hell. Um, they have a read-only tokens, which is like, great, but where's my publish token? Like, why can't I just generate a CI token that I will be used to publish one package? And that's it. And it's it's like infuriating from my opinion, but maybe they fix it at some point. Maybe they already did and I just didn't know about that. So last time I checked, it's like, it was a bit annoying. Okay, they got a brand new cache and offline installs. Again, you know, speeding up the whole thing. Reproducible builds, uh, again, PMCI thing, which is kind of great. And publish and pack improvements. So with more info and more kind of insights into what actually you publish and what you pack. Always great. Better Git support. NPM hooks, which is always kind of nice. And um, yeah, there's some additional minor, more minor things. Uh, you know, if you're interested, if you didn't know for whatever reason what NPM guys did, do have a look at that. Okay, continuing, we got the um, releases section, I think, is it releases? It is a releases section. So our first major release of this week, and this is something I already talked about, is Node.js version 10, which is kind of mind blowing that we are already at version 10, you know? It is still in uh, sort of early phases, so it's not gonna be um, LTS yet. I believe it's gonna become LTS in October. Yeah, it is October, there we go. 
Uh, but it's still really, really awesome to see it. So there's upgrades to OpenSSL, upgrades to V8 to 6.6, .6, which means more speed just because you swap the version essentially. The NRP that we already talked about and a bunch of other really cool things like uh, modernized crypto, for example. Yeah, again, the OpenSSL upgrade and TLS 1.3 spec and all that kind of stuff. Error handling improvements. So the promises, for example, now actually uh, exit, I believe. And uh, you can now use catch without uh, specifying the error as well. So like the, um, what was conditionless catch, I believe it's called. Performance improvements, obviously V866 has a really cool, um, a really cool, like some really cool optimizations. And I believe some people reported that they basically just by swapping the node version, they got, uh, I believe on Twitter, I saw the one of the people posted that uh, their app was handling something like 40,000 requests per second with nodes uh, eight. And then once they switched to node 10, it became like on 10 to 12,000 requests more per second, just because of the node switch. Yeah, yeah 10,000 more, exactly. This was like, I was like, whoa, okay, that is some serious optimizations. But I mean, as I always say, V8 guys just keep amazing me with how they able to improve the performance of exactly the same code, but just, just by tweaking the engine, essentially, it's insane. Yeah, so you now have improved diagnostics, trace and postmortem. There's now obviously support for hooks and uh, they allow you to do some crazy things. MPM6, which is another release we'll talk about, it's still not there, so no 10 ships with 5.6, but uh, MPM6 is out, so you can actually just upgrade to it. Uh, there is FS promises, which is a promisified version of FS functions. It's still experimental for whatever reason, I'm not sure why, but uh, seems to be working pretty fine. And yeah, again, new JavaScript functions because it's a new V8, so we got some uh, bunch of things there. And uh, yeah, as you know, it's, it's a great release with a lot of cool things and uh, really looking forward to using it. And yes, another awesome thing is because we have this N API now that allows us to switch engines easily, there is actually now official Node 10 version with Chakra Core as the engine in there. You can just download it from here and use it, which is like freaking amazing in my opinion. It's like, man, what a time to be alive, huh? All right, uh, next release we have is also a major one. We got NPM six, which is coming. So they had this, we, we at some point were looking at the survey where they talked about the security and everything. And then they per acquired the company that did security. And NPM six has a, a, the ma major highlight is the security built in. So you can run this NPM audit thing, which will actually tell you what kind of packages might have vulnerabilities in them, which is really really awesome so basically your package manager now allows you to uh, audit your own dependencies and figure out if there's something wrong with them and uh it, it even seems to help you find a safer alternative which is kind of insane when you think about it i don't think i don't know if any other package managers like the, the package manager from other programming languages do that but uh, it's really cool to see that and there's also yeah some like performance improvements optimizations, webhook management, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, it's more boring than all this actually. Okay, uh, next thing we got the RxJS 6.0 released, which is seems to be more sort of um, cleaner release, like the cleanup release that is simplifying the internal structure without breaking too much. Uh, it has even, they even released the compat package this time around and you can update without changing your code, which is kind of insane, it's awesome, like really, really great. And they also added the automatic code migration TypeScript, which is like great as well. Um, hard time finding tutorials on RxJS 5.5. I mean, five, four, 4 to 5 didn't really change that much. They had like a couple of operators that they tweaked to fit to the observable spec that is being pushed uh, to uh, JavaScript now or ECMAScript spec, right? But that was all, it was like a few methods, literally. It's like, so just look for Rx tutorials in general, they do not change that much. The API is actually quite stable. So I would not look for a specific version tutorials. MPM for safe space. Absolutely, I'm highly supporting this. I mean, this is awesome actually. It was the fact that you can audit your code from your package manager, right? man, sign me up. Okay, yeah, so this is like really great. I'm a huge fan of RxJS. Uh, if you did know, I've used it in a bunch of projects. It's an amazing tool. And if you ever need to work with things asynchronously, this is like my go-to library essentially. All right, next release we have is a Webpack uh, 4.6, 
which adds supports for prefetching and preloading things uh, among the other minor things. So again, code splitting is playing a huge uh, role here. And uh, you can do this via this sort of common thing for Webpack, which is, I mean, I guess this is a viable solution, but I just don't really like how it looks. Um, just my, you know, picking, I know that will work amazingly as always, Webpack guys do a great job, but it's like the syntax itself is a bit wonky. So yeah, uh, again, if you are using Webpack, great times for you. There's some more really cool things coming on and uh, it's really awesome to see the contributors. So there's like a really large companies donating money for the Webpack um, foundation or whatever they are to help develop the Webpack. And it's, it's really, really cool to see all of that. Um, yeah. All right, next thing we got is a minor release of Preact. We got 8.2.8 and it's mostly related to improvements to TypeScript definitions and some minor fixes for the debug tools. Um, again, you know, if you are using Preact or uh, if you are like me who just replaces React to Preact once deploying the app to production, always awesome to see that. Um, you know, more improvements, more fixes, always great. Right, next thing we got the pose. I think I already talked about it at some point, but uh, it's a declarative motion system, so the animation system. And uh, prior to this release, it was working for HTML, SVG, and React. Well, they just released it for React Native, which is just mind blowing. So you can use this code in React Native, which is like just insane. Like it's awesome. Like you can, you can do that. This is just great. Like, like look at that. You can just do that and it will work and you will see nice animations in React Native. Just think about it for a second. Native views that are animated using a simple JavaScript library. Like this is just mind blowing. I think I'm gonna use it in my next um, React Native project, so yeah. Okay, this is the last release we have for today. Now we got the libraries section or libraries demos and all that other stuff. First thing we have is a mini zone, is a zoning using async hooks. Um, so if you are not familiar, there's this zones.js library, which is essentially allows you to create um, zones. I, be, I believe it's a concept from Dart initially, if I remember that. But the idea is, come on, Dart link, load faster, please. There we go. Yeah, uh, so you can run things within zones, right? And then catch errors from that zone specifically. So if the zone throws, your app doesn't fail or it can be isolated and so on and so forth. So it's sort of like, kind of like sandbox, but not really. And uh, prior to that, you had to like work on some, you know, had to do some crazy workarounds essentially to make that work within the browser or Node.js or whatever. But now actually, since Node has a sync hook, so you can do it quite simple. So the library is actually pretty damn small. It's like, yeah, 38 lines of code. There you go. It's probably more tests than, than the code. It's, no, okay, tests are also pretty small. But yeah, you know, it's a pretty interesting uh, library and uh, really good for learning the async, how the async hooks works, I think. Okay, next thing we have is Perfume.js. It's a JavaScript library for measuring short long script, first contentful paint, time to interactive, and components first paint. Cool thing is that there's a lot of tools that allow you to do that, but the cool thing is this one integrates with Google Analytics. So you can literally plug this into your uh, website and then uh, have the C essentially, where's the images, what the hell? Come on, let me permit all of that. There was an example of image in Google Analytics. There you go. So you can actually see in Google Analytics, how does the website performs for your users, which I think is absolutely mind blowing. So this is like really, really awesome thing. So if you're interested in tracking performance across the users, definitely have a look at that. Uh, what do you think about Flutter versus React? I think I've heard the name Flutter, but I never poked it myself. So let me have a quick look maybe at the end of the stream. Let's bring it back to that. Okay, uh, let us continue with the libraries. So next thing we have for today, what, no, got to, to, what, what do you want from me? There we go, okay. Um, next thing we have is Day.js. It's a fast two kilobyte immutable date library that is similar to Moment.js, but um, basically smaller and modern, right? Um, so API looks very similar, pretty much what you expect. It's just two kilobytes. Um, the one thing it says all browsers support, but it's like, I would love to see the table. Do they literally mean all browsers? Because if they do, then 
why do I need moment.js anymore? Um, if they not, then I'm not sure. So yeah, it's basically, I just have to dig in a bit more, I guess, seems to be Chinese as well, available in Chinese. I should start it, I should investigate it more, but it seems like, yeah, you know, if it's literally the same library as moment.js, but with a two kilobyte footprint, I would take that over anything. This is kind of amazing. Okay. Uh, next thing we have is a grid to flex. It's a website that basically shows you how to do page layouts using Flexbox or rather using uh, both Flexbox and grid and um, sort of, you know, how do you fall back to Flexbox when the browser does not support grid, right? Because grid is a fairly new API. Flexbox is supported by all the older browsers. So it's a pretty nice comparison. You know, okay, say, okay, I just want a Flexbox or I just want a grid or I want both, right? And there's this really interesting supports grid thing, which is pretty cool. So I did not, for example, did not know that how to, how you could do that with, uh, I, I'm not sure, is that a pure CSS or is it like a SAS or something? I I mean, I'm not an expert in CSS, so all of that looks alien to me or kind of alien to me, but it's really cool that there is this this kind of stuff. And yeah, you get like, you know, the flexible resizing and all that stuff and uh, it's pretty neat. So yeah, if you are looking into CSS, do have a look. I too say my projects work in all browsers. Well, I mean, I love to say that as well, but you have to prove that, right? So we used to have like the, the uh, was it browser labs or whatever, those one of those websites that allows you to run your project in like 25 different browsers to see if that works. Especially the enterprise guys love to do that stuff and it's like, it's especially in Red Explorer 9 and 10. Oh man, that is that can bring so much pain. I'm so happy that they are end of life now. <laughs> All right, continuing. We got another small website. It's a Webpack 4 configurator. Um, if you are lazy and if you just want a basic configuration, this is a website that allows you to just say, okay, I want React, one CSS, one moment, want uh, less and Lodash, and it's in production mode. And you get a nice complete webpack config, which is, I mean, it's pretty simplistic, right? So it doesn't really do a lot of things, but if you're just too lazy to write it or find it in the docs, then it's a nice website. We can just do that. So yeah, pretty neat. Okay. Next thing we got is a Tui calendar and uh, it's a very fancy one. So it's a calendar widget that has just about anything you might want. It's like, it's a full fledged calendar, which looks like, to be honest, the Google calendar. And you have events that you can delete and edit and you know, all of those pop-ups and everything. And this is just one widget. So <laughs> literally you can do it weekly, daily, weeks, narrow weeks, task schedule, task only, you can change themes, whatever. All of that in one, one widget, which is like crazy. So if you ever looked for a full flesh calendar with all the features that you can imagine, then this is definitely your go-to. And it works in EA 9 plus, which is like just insane <laughs> to be honest. So this is really awesome. And again, you know, if you looked for a crazy calendar, then this is probably the thing you want to have a look at. And it's post version 1.0, so it's definitely production ready. All right, next thing is a Tone.js. It's a framework for creating interactive music in the browser. And instead of just showing you um, how it works, I will show you that you can actually play some music. Let me just turn on the audio here real quick. So what you hear right now, and hopefully it's not too loud and does not cover my voice over, is music generated by that framework. And right now, okay, this is like pre sequence stuff, but you can actually make your own bits. You can literally make them in real time. And you can save them and then you can edit them and there's like a full fledged Fruity Loops essentially here, which is just like crazy. Really cool thing. Um, so if you're looking to play with music in the browser, do have a look at that. It has effect processing and all that you can imagine. Uh, even instrument splitting, which is like, just, yeah. Uh, if you are interested in that kind of stuff, do have a look. All right, continuing, we got a permit. It's an unopinionated authentication library for building Node.js APIs. So it seems to be aiming to replace uh, quite dated Passport.js, which, you know, still never had any real problems with Passport.js, it worked pretty fine. Um, uh, so yeah, this is, seems to be um, more modern working with Express, Core, Happy, Fastify, whatever you can imagine, can be used with REST, GraphQL, whatever as well. So the API seems to be very straightforward and very nice. Um, 
there is an explanation of why you should choose that over the passport. So, you know, it's actually not just authentication. So you can actually do a lot more things. Um, it is tightly coupled to express. Oh, it is passport tightly coupled to express. Okay, I see. Okay, this is the downsides of the passport. They decided to run that way. Okay, but yeah, it's it seems to be quite nice actually. And they have a pretty decent docs and examples for all the frameworks. So yeah. Now you can do shitty Fruity Loops music not just on your desktop. Uh, that's also true. I mean, who doesn't want to do shitty Fruity Loops music on their mobile phones or on the go, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, next thing we have is PKI.js. It's a uh, pure JavaScript implementation uh, for working with uh, public key crypto, essentially. Uh, signing encryption certificates, OCSP, TSP requests, and all that kind of stuff, right? So I actually, in ExoFrame, I had to implement something like this myself, and I wouldn't say it was nice. So I definitely welcome a library like this. Why did I not start that? I need start, to start that. So it allows you to parse certificates, create certificates, uh, sign messages, works in browser and in Node.js, which is actually pretty cool considering the browser is soon getting the web crypto, which is even better. Um, there are some limitations obviously because of the web crypto and all that kind of stuff, uh, but definitely excited to see the crypto field in JavaScript developing further because it is, I mean, it, it's kind of okay right now, but I definitely would want to see more support for, you know, more widespread techniques that are considered to be normal in like Python or Golang, for example. Yeah, so definitely cool one. Uh, do I look at it? Right, next we have the emittery, which is a simple and modern async event emitter. Um, again, Sindra Soros, Mr. Sindra, delivering us a lot of awesome open source software just about every time. Uh, as usual, 200 bytes minified and gzipped, very small, very tiny, very cool. API is super simple, you literally create new emitter on and then you emit. That's literally it. But if you are looking for a nice wrapper around the default event emitter and node, which is kind of a bit of a pain in ass to use, to be honest, this is like probably is gonna be my go-to package, so yeah. Okay, then have a look at the Flutter before we wrap this up. If you guys have any other links or things that you think I missed over the last week, or you just want to discuss, feel free to throw them uh, in the chat right now. If you have any questions, do throw them in the chat as well. Uh, we can talk about that stuff. So meanwhile, let me have a, the Flutter. So Flutter is a Google's mobile app SDK for crafting high quality native interfaces on iOS and Android in record time. I always like, I always like those kind of, uh, statements is like record time. What does it mean? That doesn't really mean anything, right? Like what is, what, what is record time? Record, there's no records in this space. So it's a bit weird. Flutter works with existing code is used by developers and organizations around the world and is free and open source. Okay, get started, faster development. That looks like React. Okay, that looks like, that, that literally looks like React. <laughs> Every library is now blazing. Yep, yep, exactly. Every library is now blazing. Um, yeah, so this seems to be Dart and that looks like React. So I like, I don't know, I'm not sure. It looks pretty, the UI look pretty, that looks nice. Um, that is like, I, get, I know that they've like formed Dart to be a better JavaScript, but to be honest, that doesn't look that different from the modern JavaScript. <laughs> so I don't know if I see any like real advantages here. Um, 16 hours could be a record time. I mean, man, come on. I did a live stream where I put up a finished React Native app in like one and a half hours. So 16 hours is not a record time, come on. <laughs> okay, um, unified app development, building, optimizing, deploying. Uh, okay, so they have the integrated distribution there as well. But I mean, React Native has that all of that as well. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's quite hard to say, you know, what kind of advantages will it have over React Native without actually trying it first, because I've, um, I mean, the link was already blue when I clicked it on my Google. So apparently I already looked at it at some point, but I don't remember. And I'm sure that I never used it. So I, I guess it looks fine. You know, if, if it's Google behind it and it's likely gonna be supported for ages to come, Seems to be not quite uh, production ready yet, right? So it's like Flutter, yeah. So it's it's just in beta for now, and the Dart is definitely not in beta, but the Flutter is. So I don't know if you would want to use that in production yet. And uh, but yeah, you know, it looks nice. It's like yeah, Dart seems to be a pretty decent language. The React-ish style seems to be quite good, and like okay. 
I guess, you know, if, if that's, if that's the stuff that you want to stick with for your next project, then sure, go ahead and try it. it doesn't seem to be terrible. But yeah. I, I honestly, I just prefer, I like JavaScript, you know, I, th that's why I'm talking about JavaScript news on the podcast, for God's sake. So I would personally stick for React Native, at least for now, and see, you know, how this ends up. Maybe they are planning to release it as a main, like, programming thing for the, um, what was their, their new OS project, like Fuxia or whatever was it? So I think maybe that's what they were trying to pull off. But uh, yeah, I'm just curious how it will develop essentially at this point. It's like, it looks interesting, sure. But um, I don't know. It's like there's, there's plenty of projects that allow you to compile nice language into a mobile app. Um, currently Apple is making things harder for React Native. Yeah, but it's mostly Expo, right? They only have those guidelines where you can like, you have to have your own account and you can only run your own apps within Expo, that's it. I don't think they're gonna do anything with React Native. It's like, it's, it's gonna be extremely stupid because React Native is extremely powerful and very flexible technology that allows you to do really cool apps very quick. And I don't think Apple will kill that because it, it's, it's only a benefit for them to have more apps. So yeah, they removed the QR scanner and marketplace because that essentially allows you to push arbitrary code around the app store, which is definitely not something Apple wants. I mean, this is a complete dick move and I still hate Apple for the way they manage their app store, but this is, you know, this is their ecosystem and they want to control it hundred percent. And that's understandable. This is like, I, I really, I actually was more surprised when I learned you could do that with Expo in the first place because Apple was always very strict about the whole thing. But yeah. Okay. Um, all right, guys, anything else you want to talk about? Uh, if not, then we can wrap it up here. I think that's basically it from my side. So if you had, don't really have any other questions, um, yeah, I'm basically done. I just want to go and crash somewhere and sleep more and, and I don't know, play some video games, play some God of War and stuff like this. Um, they are not likely to die out. I do think they will have to change significantly because I mean, Apple, like they are losing the market share right now, I think, right? Because Android is pushing really hard and, and has been pushing really hard, especially in a, like more uh, like markets, like the larger markets that are not as rich as US or whatever. IBM didn't die out. I mean, they just pivoted, right? The IBM doesn't really do what they used to do anymore. They just like, they do machine learning right now, for example. IBM Watson is an incredible thing. And uh yeah, so but we'll see how it goes. Maybe Apple releases Apple Car and then they're suddenly a car company, you know, or maybe they go into the AR space and they release a new super AR glasses and they break the market just as they did with an iPhone. I mean, I would love that, to be honest. I would love like an awesome AR glasses that would be just as my normal glasses, but would have like screens in them. That would be fucking amazing. That's like my dream, basically. So yeah, I mean, we're, we're it's like, it's really hard to say what they're going to do, but uh, I think they're definitely not going to keep doing what they do because their last generation of, of laptops at least is garbage. All So many people are not happy with that. And there's like keyboard problems, heating problems, monitor problems, whatever else. And there seems to be a very high percentage of the like broken laptops essentially. The iPhones, that notch is still like haunting me in my dreams. That thing looks just so obnoxious. I like I don't know why they decided it was a good idea. It's just like I don't... Um, hey, DKW Deft, uh, I'm not sure how to read your username, so um, I'm going to read it like this. Welcome. We are actually almost wrapping up. So unless you have any questions about JavaScript news or you have um, anything to discuss, we are, I'm actually going to, yeah, just, just stop the stream, I guess. So anything else you guys want to talk about? Anything else you want to hear me talk about? Let's put it this way. Um, if not, then yes, as I said, I am super tired. I don't know if, if it's visible on a cam. I hope not because man, visiting over eight c cities in two weeks is yeah, a bit, a bit tiring. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like you have any other questions. Uh, let me just wait for a few more seconds, I guess. Maybe you react, maybe you, maybe something pop ups into your mind. Go get some sleep. Yes, I do need some sleep, but I also want to play some God of War. You know, I need need, need to need to Arduino JS. Uh, what about Arduino JS? I know that they have a J. Oh, whoops, JS SDK, right? 
it was like yeah journey 5 was the thing it was the, the platform that is actually quite uh, they raised quite some money to make it happen seems to be quite good actually so i it's absolutely viable iot using javascript seems to be working pretty well actually at least not for the like you know the super computational stuff so if you want to do heavy computations you'll probably still need to fall back into the c lands and do native modules or whatever but uh, if you just want to control iot devices using javascript that seems to be working pretty well so do you have any specific questions or what do you want to talk about other program or you know uno javascript javascript robotics i think even samsung invested in the iot like uh, sdk using javascript at some point wasn't it like uh samsung iot js Oh yeah, they even have this IoT.js thing. There you go. I mean, come on. <laughs> JavaScript is literally everywhere right now. It's like, I keep thinking that bet on JavaScript is the correct thing. No, but that's the thing. You want you want to make the robot slower, right? It's like, it's just the use case based thing. So like, if you, if you want to do, I don't know, face recognition or whatever, you want to do it in JavaScript, especially in the IoT device because you're very limited with the resources. You would write a C module and then plug it into Node and then just call it from Node.js. There's very tiny overhead. You will still have your nice Node API and you will be able to use your like CPU or GPU heavy logic, which is, it works. It, it, it's, a, it's a proven thing. It works pretty, pretty well. I have idea for a stream TypeScript and WebAssembly for a super fast to do. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why would you want a super fast to do <laughs> And also, what would you put to web into WebAssembly code, like storing and deleting to do uh, tasks, just to make it super fast? Uh, I'm not a good programmer for C. Would you recommend me to do? Um, I'm not. I'm like. I'm. I'm not a C guy as well. So sorry. Can I really recommend you many like things here? But I'm actually. Is there any good books? C programming books. There was the, I, I remember reading something about C when I was in university, which was considered like to be one of the best books on it. Hell if I remember, what was it? Um, wasn't it the, the practical C maybe? I think it was the practical C programming. Yeah. 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 It was it definitely 1991. There we go. I mean, it's good to know more than one language, like learning JS is great, but don't box yourself into one language. It's always great to expand your knowledge and go into other languages, even if you no longer write them after learning them, you know? It will still give you a very cool insight into how things work, right? So it's, it's in my opinion, it's important to actually take it out of your, you get out of your comfort zone and go learn something different. Uh, Aurelian, their covers are, yeah, I don't, like I don't even ask, it's like, <laughs> But yeah, this is the book that I read in university when I was learning C and I remember it was really, really good. So if you're interested, then uh, this is probably the only thing I can recommend, to be honest. <laughs> there's probably better things by now, but um, yeah, there's like look up at Quora, I guess. It's like, what do they recommend here? C programming language. Is that like by, by okay, no, the Strauss troop um, programming C and NC, let us see. Uh, I'm probably not the right guy to ask about C. Um, JavaScript is not like Java and uh, Oracle hates everyone for using JavaScript name because everyone thinks it's like Java. JavaScript is closer to Python or Ruby if I would compare it to something. So it's it's a scripting language, it does not compile, uh, but it is very flexible and allows you to do some really cool things. Um, I mean, there's this, uh, wait a second, I know Babel has really cool examples of how the JavaScript looks. So here's a pretty good examples of how JavaScript looks. This, for example, the classes, objects, string templates. I mean, yeah, like if you know Python or Ruby, then this is like the JavaScript is moving very much into that direction. So yeah. Babel, uh, PHP to JS. Yeah, PHP to JS Babel was insane. I just, like, I mean, it's a really cool project from the sort of, uh, engineering perspective, but oh man, I don't know. Like I still have terrible memories about PHP because I had to work on a PHP code base, which was written by students essentially. And 
had some very weird things going on in it that I had to fix at some point, which was like quite painful. So <laughs> like, I mean, you know, PHP inherently is not a bad language, but um, I also use Babel stage zero, but I actually use it in production as well. Even though, you know, stage zero, the only thing that you actually risk is the syntax changing at some point, right? But the interesting thing is that the proposals are typically so good that even at stage zero, they still don't change the syntax significantly. I think one of the few things that was like, uh, that is still undecided on syntax is the um, uh, class decorator proposal. I think this is the only thing that is still like kind of not working out because everything else is still stays the same from stage zero. So the, oh, the bind syntax was also something that was dropped, I believe, completely. Yes, six binds. Did they actually, did they drop the proposals? I'm now very curious. So there's an arrow functions and there's the bind proposal. Uh, I don't know, propose, yeah, bind operator. Is it still active? Because hell, if I, I've heard about it, hell I know when. Uh, pipeline operator is fucking awesome. Like I can't wait for the new Babel because I just want to use a pipeline operator. I'm a huge fan of functional programming and man, that thing is just like, ooh, man. Things are not looking good for observables, really. Oh, okay, that's disappointing. I mean, on the other hand, I still have my RxJS, so I, like, I don't really need them in the core. It would be nice, but uh, yeah. What is the stage of that? Where's this? Is there a stage? No, there's no stage. Okay, that's interesting. Issues, uh, can we have simple object method binding syntax? Is this proposal dead? That's a good question. 44 has active discussion. Mostly proposal is near dead. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so there's basically something happening to this proposal. This binding all together. Okay, yeah, but yeah, there's some proposals that basically didn't work out. And uh, yeah, the optional operator is also amazing. That is definitely something I'm looking for. I, I'm like the C sharp has this, the op uh, optional chaining. I absolutely loved it. I was like writing code in JS without it is always a huge pain. <laughs> so yes, um, okay, wait me observable proposal. There we go, proposal observable. Um, last update happened. October 16, 2017. Yeah, that was quite a long time ago. So why is it stale? That's interesting because I thought there's like, I mean, we have already implementation references here and there was someone championing it. So I'm kind of curious what happens. Um, proposal rename unsubscribe, minor spec editor issues, 27, three days ago. Okay, this seems to be quite recent. Uh, you're not really starting stopping it, blah, 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 open close. Okay, Option. Uh, the author said it. Okay, that is a bit of a shame. Uh, may maybe she just doesn't have, uh, that committee is not really into bringing it to spec. Okay, that's a bit unfortunate, but on the other hand, I mean, you know, we have an RxJS, which is a freaking amazing library. So I don't really know if we need it in spec. Um, it's like, yeah. I guess, you know, it's not, not, I wouldn't say it's a major loss for the spec, to be honest. So it's like, as long as the guys from Microsoft keep working on making our rigs better, I'm, I'm okay with not bringing it into the spec because it's like, this stuff is just incredible. I'm not even sure if I would like, aside from the obvious optimizations from the engine side, so the V8 guys and, you know, Chakra guys and all, all the uh, engine teams would work on optimizing the observables internally but now they just work on optimizing the general JavaScript and you will just get general optimization. So I guess that's fine. That's like the only downside I personally can see. Maybe I'm just missing something, but I don't really think that's a huge problem. Um, I would be very sad if they drop pipeline or optional chaining operators, but that actually doesn't seem to be the case. DC 39, so we can have a look. We probably have uh, temp. Yeah, so there's like three proposals that I'm super excited about. That is the pipeline, that is the pattern matching, and that is the optional chaining, which I don't see, where is it? 
uh, optional chain. There we go. So we got, yeah, th those three is something that I would fucking absolutely love to see in the JavaScript. This is like, would make it so functional because, uh, you know, that, that I would just, I would love, absolutely love to write more functional JavaScript. And there are some things that just make it less nice. And uh, yeah, so what is stage one already? So this is definitely not in getting dropped. Uh, pipeline operator, is there a stage? Latest presentation, uh, stage one, cool. Okay, and we got pattern matching, which is still a stage zero, but it's been, it's been significantly reworked quite recently. So maybe we'll see it moving to stage one as well. Uh, match operator is stage, uh, yeah, yeah, stage zero, yeah. So, but you know, it has a significant reward just recently. I think I covered it two episodes ago or something. But um, I mean, this stuff is just awesome. This is like, you know, I mean, we already have destruction, right? This is essentially matching destruction with an output. Just like, uh, please don't remind me that I need to sleep. <laughs> I just, I just, 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 I am love talking about JavaScript. I know that I just need to go and just, you know, be a potato, couch potato and do nothing, but I still can't stop talking about JavaScript. Okay. Um, all right. You know what? I'm just, I'm just going to follow the advice from HSRU and go to sleep for, that is way too much, by the way. So I'm not going to sleep that much. Uh, do I dream of JavaScript? I do not really dream of JavaScript. I dream of, I sometimes, very rarely, I dream about the projects that I'm really excited about. Like the, I've actually dreamt about the BXGS Weekly at some point because I did this stream where I was just like talking and doing news and then some people was like, let's do the news podcast. And I was so excited that I was like, okay, I've actually dreamt how I did the podcast. That was a very weird experience. That is eight hours in milliseconds. Uh, okay, that makes sense. I um, would not know how much is eight hours in milliseconds, but thank you for enlightening me. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, that's I think a good point to stop. Eight hours of sleep sounds like a good thing. Um, traveling tomorrow again, by the way. So um, yeah, I'm probably gonna die at some point of this program, but <laughs> right. Well, thank you very much guys for watching this thing. Thank you very much for staying with me through the end. Thank you very much for your questions and for your discussion points. That was really interesting to talk about all of that. Uh, again, if you have any cool news that I you think I might have missed that you think I should cover, feel free to send them over my way in Twitch, in YouTube and Discord or whatever. If you die, can I have your channel? Okay, sure, I can uh, make a will and uh, send it to you. <laughs> That's that's not, but you will have to do all of that yourself. You understand that, right? It looks easy, but then you start doing it when you're tired and you're like, oh my God, I just, I just, no. But yeah, okay. <laughs> Jokes aside. If you find any cool news, send it my way. Discord, uh, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, whatever you like. I will be more than happy to cover your uh, news or even if you make any projects or whatever, your libraries, your cool releases, send them over my way. We'll be happy to show it off here as well. So um, thank you guys for watching. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or I guess rest of the Sunday at this point. And I see you next week. Bye.